Yeah, Alright guys, so, we're back with more revision, part two. Um, I just want to check, can you guys read the text here? Because if my whiteboard's gone and flipped, as in like if the screen has flipped, I just realised these will not be helpful at all, these streams, unless I obviously got brought out the camera. So let, let me know, can you, can you at least read this? text to you. I have gone and up these streams to 3000 kilobytes per second and I've upped the frames per second to 60. You guys are getting the best possible visual experience here. I really mean that. Uh, this is the best quality that I can do without my phone combusting. Today, this is our plan. I'm going to go through electrolysis, which is a lesson that we did today. Then, I'm gonna do a recap of the lesson we did yesterday. And finally, we're both gonna learn mitosis because I suck at learning mitosis um, because I've never learned it before. So, let's get into things with electrolysis. Now I'm gonna have one glance. Okay, so. I am literally now just going to write everything that I possibly know about this topic and then I'm going to kind of go through and explain it, okay? So, electrolysis. It looks a bit like this. You have your solution here. You have an electrode here. An electrode there. This one is positive. This one is negative. All right, now, the positive one, hang on, if I, if I, if I literally just remember this, the positive one is the anode, okay. The positive is the anode, the negative is the cathode. Okay. So positive anode and negative cathode. Now what you need to remember is non-metal metal. Negative metal. Um, so I, I guess I should explain what electrolysis is. So it, it's for extracting metals. So what you have to do, this solution here is called your electrolyte. Electrolyte. And basically it either needs to be an aqueous a molten solution. It needs to be in liquid form. Oh, I spelled liquid. Wrong. Liquid form. It needs to be in liquid form. So, basically, let's say we have... I, I, I don't really know. Um, a, a good example is... Um, Aluminium, but uh, let's just get back to base. Non-metal is at the positive because if you if you look at the periodic table, the metals have positive charges. Sorry, negative charges, which means they are of course attracted. Oh my god, no, doing this on the wrong side. I'm so sorry. Sorry, the metals do have positive charges, and thus they are attracted to the negative. And this, what, what, this is, is confusing me because I've done this a different way around. The non-metal, non-metals are negatively charged, which is why they go to the anode. Okay, now, oxidation and reduction. Those are the, the two interesting things that you need to think about. When um, part of it loses or gains electrons, that's what it's called. Um, so, oxidation is when it loses and reduction is actually quite a piss take of a nerve because that's when it gains electrons. So that's basically it, I would say. That's basically all you, all you need to know, uh, at least for like what we did today. Uh, there was that whole thing he, he talked about as well, uh, aluminium, um, electrolysis of that, and it was, it was where the cathode was on the outside, a bit like this, 
and both of these electrodes were actually anodes. So basically, all the non-metal, um, like I think oxygen, because if we look, I think it's aluminium oxide. So this is what you can find in, in nature, in the wild, uh, as an ore. And of course, aluminium is your metal, which means that's gonna be the cathode. And oxygen is your non-metal, which means it's gonna be the anode. Now, most of these electrodes are made out of uh, graphite. Graphite is carbon. Uh, and if you think about it, if oxygen is going into here, the carbon, it's gonna make carbon dioxide and slowly eat away at the shape of it. So you need to constantly replace these. So that's basically it. That's basically it. I'll, I'll draw a little arrow to explain that there. Um, replace constantly. Oh, and I guess there's one more thing you need to remember, and that is aluminium. Um, you find it, I mean, just think, like, playing Minecraft. <laughs> Imagine finding iron ore. You don't find iron liquid or, or whatever. You find it ore, a solid. You need to get that to a liquid. Uh, and the thing with aluminium, it has a fecking high uh, melting point, which means, I think it's 2,000 degrees um, Celsius, which means you need to use cryolite in order to reduce that heat to about a thousand degrees. Um, so cryolite. And that reduces it from about 2000 to 1000. Because remember, an ore is something, uh, it is a metal in a rock, which is economically viable to extract. Remember that. That is a definition that is worth two marks in the exam, roughly. Uh, or it might be one of those piss off tick questions or whatever. Uh, but either way, it has to be economically viable to get. And, you know, heating something to 2000 degrees to get it into a molten solution, that is going to be expensive as piss. So obviously, you're going to use cryolite to reduce it uh, quite significantly. Serving you costs serving energy, all good. Because remember, aluminium can't be an aqueous solution, it has to be a molten. So I guess we'll draw, draw a little connection there, and then we'll draw a connection there. All right, if you guys want to take a screenshot of this, I don't know how well you guys will be able to read that, to be completely honest with you, but in summary, electrolysis is what you need to use in order to extract metals when, or just extract anything really. You can use it for like seawater, for example. Um, and yeah, electrolysis is different to, I think it's, is it reduction or, what's it called? Displacement, displacement. I, I believe that's the term. Um, oh no, it is. I was right the first time, reduction. So. In order to extract, okay, I'm going to rub this off, guys, so rewind the stream if you need to look at it properly. But in order to get a metal, right, like, let's go back to ground zero. Let's say we have our metal here. Look, it's in a rock. You have some nice bits of metal with black things there in it. Okay, now how do we extract the metal out of it? Well, you, you can either use reduction, um, which requires carbon. And what that will do is it will get you it, or if it is a, if it is more reactive than carbon, it can't be reduced. So you need to use electrolysis. So that's the origin of electrolysis. Okay, now let me go look through my book and see if there is anything else I need to know for this. Okay. Electro- oh! Holy shit, important. Electrolysis only works in ionic compounds. Ionic compounds, remember, are things like, um, I don't know, calcium carbonate, carbox, I don't know. Uh, th things like that, kind of. 
it only works, it won't work with like simple molecules or things like that. Um, it has to be in a solution or melted. We've said that already. Um, electrodes must, okay. We're just missing kind of a bare details here really. But the electrodes, you know, the positive and negative things here, they must be able to conduct electricity to complete this circuit. Because without that, it's not going to do piss anything, is it? Um, oh, a brilliant, brilliant little tip here. If you're struggling to remember which one, P, A, N, C. Positive anode, negative cathode. P, A, N, C, or panic, I guess. I, I guess if you put an I in there somewhere. But yeah, I think that's everything. Well, let me just take a look. I guess you could also, if, if it's a six mark question where it's like, write how you would extract a metal, include lattice breaks down. That's a good one to use. Remember, ionic lattice is this thing here. It breaks down a bit like me uh, whenever Luke Kelly messages me. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. A bit like Alex whenever um someone joins his Discord, basically it breaks down. <laughs> so like it breaks down, yeah. And then the negatives go to one side, the positives go to one side. I hope you guys understand this because you know this is quite a this is honestly the toughest thing you need to learn. Uh, well, one of the toughest things, I, I know so many people, I, I was talking to, I think, TJ a while ago or something, and he was like, oh, I, I hate electrolysis, it, it's the worst. But honestly, if you remember what I've just told you, and look at that, 12 minutes I've been streaming, for the last two minutes, I've just been explaining nonsense. 10 minutes of learning that, and I have summarized everything to help you possibly get another grade. And I've also reminded myself of a lot of good stuff there. Also, bauxite. Bauxite is the name for al aluminium ore. Okay? Remember that. Bauxite. It's a goofy-ass name. It'll stand out on the exam paper. Um, let's have a look at half equations quickly. Now, I'm going to do one of these because he hasn't actually gone through these with us yet. But as far as I can tell, this is kind of how they work. This is literally just the electrolysis reaction. Um, so oxygen here. So look at this. 2O times 2. So that's 4 oxygen in total. And here we are losing 4 electrons twice. 4, four uh, negative 2. So if you look, that has a negative 2 charge. That has a negative 2 charge. So it's basically cancelling them out. And as a result, um, I think that's kind of all I wrote, to be honest. Basically, it loses electrons. That negative two there means that it's losing electrons. It, it cancels it out. And your product, as a result, is that. Two, two. Anyways, I don't really understand half equations purely because we haven't gone through them yet. For context, uh, our previous chemistry teacher, while he was great, he barely explained this kind of stuff with us, or at least I've forgotten half of it. So this is honestly my first time going through a lot of the stuff, especially because halfway through last year, I had to leave for two months uh, due to like personal reasons. So I missed out on a shit ton of stuff, especially chemistry. So there you go, guys. Less than 15 minutes now, and I have explained a lot of stuff. Okay, there is higher content stuff here. So if you're not higher, maybe, like, give this a miss. And I'm honestly not too sure myself of what any of this means. He hasn't gone through it too much. But as far as I can tell, when you're doing electrolysis of something like seawater, if the negative ion is a halogen, it is discharged, um, and one of the things 
is given off and it stays off. So in other words, So on this side, if the metal, if hydrogen is less reactive than the metal, um, it is discharged. And if the negative ion, uh, basically the thing on this side, is a halogen, a group 7, it is discharged. That's kind of all you need to know. So let's, before we, before we wrap this up, where's my cloth there? Before we wrap this up and go on to the biology bit, and then finally I'll do a talk, I'll do like a review of what we've gone through uh, for yesterday, and then I think I could do a bit of English or math or something, just kind of what, what I've been learning about prior. But let's go do an exam question. Now I'm going to make this up on the spot. Let's assume a question is literally like explain process. Explain process of electrolysis. Now look, I think you have an hour and 30 in the exam. Let me go confirm that actually. I have it somewhere. I have our exam timetable somewhere. Ah, it must have slipped out of my hand or something because I don't know where that... Oh, I see it. Okay. This is my exam thing I can't show you guys because it has my name and everything on but basically how long is our chem test it is an hour 45 almost two hours surely you can spend about two minutes of that exam quickly doing what I'm about to do so let's assume it's a six mark question so we're looking to obviously hit six good points here now, let's see, let's see, we see the word electrolysis here, and we go, shit, I hate electrolysis. It is the worst. Well, remember the little acronym from before, P-A-N-C, positive anode, negative cathode. And already, you can probably nail two points. Now, it'll likely also say, uh, explain the process of electrolysis of aluminum ox aluminum uh, aluminium oxide. Explain process of electrolysis. So we can go. Aluminium oxide is an ionic compound. It looks like this. A L O. We know that this is obviously going to be the metal. This is going to be the non-metal. We know that metals have a positive charge, which means that it's going to go to the cathode. We know that the non-metals have a negative charge, which means they're going to go to the anode. Okay, now let's do the question. So we've wrote some of our details here. These will probably get us at least four marks, I think. Or maybe. Again, I'm not a chem teacher. I don't know shit. I'm just making this up as I go along. Okay, so we'll start by saying, um, I mean, I, I get, oh, you should also, of course, mention, I mean, if it specifically states aluminium, let, let's say it says, explain the process of extracting aluminium ore, I would talk about the cryolite, uh, things like that, but it doesn't here, so we don't need to explain that. So what we'll say instead is, and I'll go back to the blue pen for this so you guys can read it better. What we'll say for this is, um, we know that aluminium oxide will be put in a molten solution. So firstly, firstly, the aluminium oxide is melted. So it can, so it's, I, I, I guess, what would be a good word? So it's particles can move. Is that what I put in my book? Let me have a look. I don't want to use the wrong terminology here. But yeah, I, I think I, it has to be solution so ions can move. Okay, ions. 
Firstly, the aluminium oxide is melted so that the ions, ions are able to move. And the positive anode, or I guess just the anode, the anode and the anode and cathode electrodes are placed in in the solution I, 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 I don't know whether this would be right Ele electrically charged electrically charged okay so uh, the anode and the cathode electrodes are placed in the solution and are electrically charged uh, this causes this causes the non-metal this causes the non-metal oxygen um, to be attracted to the non-metal is obviously but I know it isn't it shit the anode, I'm just gonna, because my pen's beginning to die, I'm just gonna put vice versa here. Obviously in an exam, don't do that or you'll get slapped. Um, this, I'm just gonna, I, I normally write bus, I don't know why, it's, it's kind of a posh word. Bus, or I normally put therefore in conclusion, but I'll just put verse. Go to shake this pen a little, we'll see, see if there's any more ink coming out. Thus, um, the aluminium, the aluminium oxide is separated is separated into and oxygen now I also think oh a good match what I missed there this causes the normal and to be attracted to the uh, anode because the ionic structure okay that would be my exam response you guys are gonna have to let me know whether you think i did well but i would say maybe melted talking about it being in a molten solution i'm not sure whether specifying molten would be good enough there but I would say that's a mark. Maybe that would be a mark. Are you able to move? The anode and cathode electrodes are placed in the solution. Uh, I would say that would be a mark. This, co this causes the non-metal ions. I should have said there, I think. This causes the non-metal ions, oxygen, to be attracted to the anode because the lattice is brought. I'd say that was a mark. I'd say for saying vice versa would be a mark and saying but it is separated. So I would say that will probably be about five marks there. Think about it that way, guys. I used, I spent 10 minutes talking about that there. So that is one mark every two minutes. If you get this in your exam question, a five or six marker, you now kind of know what to say. And remember, look at my green pen annotation here. Think about it. Electrolysis, P, A, and C. And from there, you can break that down into ionic compound, you break it down to metal and non-metal, and I guess you could also what that whole joke that I said about Luke Kelly, you could even you could even put that in break down because the ionic lattice is broken down. I'm honestly pretty happy with that. You guys are gonna have to let me know how happy you are with electrolysis because I don't really mind it. I I I thought it was kind of bad, but it's okay now that I've kind of done a bit. So, what do you guys want to do now? Because I, I'm going to be on here for a whole other hour. So I'm, of course, going to take a break at, at some point. But do you guys want me to do a review of what I talked about yesterday? Um, all the topics there. Or do you want me to go right into biology? Because after a bit, I might move on to English doing a lot of the flies.
Might go pour myself a drink quickly. Um, so what I'll do, I will go end the stream, uh, and I will be back in, what time is it now? It's 48, I'll be back at quarter to, seven minutes guys, goodbye, and honestly th thank you for watching so far if you've watched. Electrolysis, for those who struggle with chemistry a lot, I would think my explanation there was actually quite good. We answered a six mark exam question there where I, I only looked at my book twice and I know that sounds bad, but I honestly think I could get pretty good marks in an exam now because of that. So I, I'm happy with my current progress there. Let's move on to biology. But in order, actually, in order to go through biology, I just realized I'm gonna have to go back downstairs and grab my flashcards that I did. So if you guys don't mind, I will be another second. Okay, hello, I'm back, and look at what I have, flashcards. Right, I am gonna need to pay as close attention to what I'm reading here as you guys. This is my tortoise. Number one, the DNA, so I'm gonna write out the phases and we'll explain. The DNA replicates to form two copies of chromosome. So, remember, cells need to divide because they, you know, they'll get old, weak. So, cell growth is, of course, a huge benefit to mitosis, or one of the reasons why it happens. I guess you could also say things like the immune system. Uh, cells do mitosis in order to help immune response. Basically, in an exam, if you're asked about mitosis... I mean, I'm thinking back to all the mocks that we've done. Have, have we ever had a question on it? We did in our most recent mocks. There was a question on how cells divide, and I don't think anybody understood it. Nobody did. So seriously, guys, if you're watching this, and you're able to pick up on some things that I'm saying here, even just loosely picking them up, you will likely be able to best a lot of people in our school in the year in of a country. So, the DNA, so let's assume this is inside a nucleus, so you have like your, your little chromosomes, you have the little, the little X things, you know how people say like X and Y chromosomes? These, what happens is they will replicate, so they will do a little, a little bit of dividing, they will replicate. So, you have two pairs of chromosomes now, they have replicated. Next, the nuclear membrane breaks down um, and the chromosomes line up. So let's assume this is our big cell. The membrane, the cell membrane, I believe this is. Oh, no, maybe it's the nucleus. I think it's the nucleus. So you know, you know how the nucleus controls the cell? Yeah, and it also contains the DNA. What I'm assuming is that the outside layer of the nucleus but again, in the exam, you can just say nuclear membrane, breaks so that all the chromosomes line up right in the centre. Are you with me so far? Well, let me know if you're not. Um, so, well, I guess we can put this into simpler terms. Number one, the DNA replicates, or the DNA doubles. Number two, membrane goes goodbye. The membrane um, breaks down. And they line up in the sensor. If you guys don't understand that, give it a read. The DNA doubles, the membrane around the DNA breaks down, they line up in the middle. 
Next, one set of chromosomes is pulled apart to each end of a cell. So now, uh, I'm stream. I'm learning history. Could you do? <laughs> oh God, yeah, no, bro. Um, so look. So basically, it goes to each of the ends here. Just like so. Goes to the opposite ends. Um, and then, the nucleus, so remember the thing that controls the cell, divides. So there are two nucleuses, almost like little eyes. Uh, and then finally, the cytoplasm um, and cell wall divide so that two identicals. So here, remember, this is just like the cell membrane, um, the thing outside of a cell. But inside the cell, you have cytoplasm everywhere. Um, so what happens here is the cytoplasm divides, the cell membrane and cell wall divide, so you get two identical cells. And look, these little chromosomes there are now part of this cell. Uh, that nucleus there is now part of that cell. Just like so. So, what is happening on the 28th? Our GCSEs. Also, I do, I, I, I do, uh, I do know that it's you, Luke Kelly. I hope it is anyways, I, I might just be talking to some random guy. But anyways, that is my mitosis. So let's go through everything. So number one, the chromosome, well the DNA divides, the DNA replicates. So that the chromosomes are doubled. Then the nuclear membrane breaks down. Nuclear membrane breaks down. Number three, chromosomes move. Uh, line up in middle. Uh, I guess I'll put sensor. Next, the nucleus divides. The nucleus replicates. Number six, the cytoplasm. No, we missed a step. The nucleus replicates. Is it? Okay, I've missed out an important step. The chromosomes line up in the center. They then uh, go to the each and opposite end. So one pair, one pair goes to uh, one side, vice versa. So then the nucleus divides of a nucleus replicates would be a more appropriate term. Nucleus replicates. Then after the nucleus replicates, the cytoplasm, um, the cytoplasm replicates so that everything is pulled to each and opposite side. Um, now, I, I do believe there was I think BBC Biosize has missed something here. Or maybe it's meiosis that it's part of, but I didn't notice there was a reference to spindle fibers there. And I believe spindle fibers are an important part of it. But I would say, if you get a six mark question on cell division, well, that's three, four marks there. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but guys, remember, that, that is 2% of your entire GCSE. That might not sound like much, but if you're getting four or five marks, that's a decent percentage along with everything else that you're learning. Um, so yeah, re really good there, really good. Now, now that we've done that, what I'm gonna do, I will do a progress test of what we did yesterday. So if you guys are in chat now and you wanna contribute to any answers, please do so, because now is a great time for not only me to test my learning, but you guys, because again, seriously, I'm covering some bulky topics here. So if you guys have anything to say, say it, okay. Crystallization we'll start with. Okay, I want you to imagine you're setting your exam. Let's say we get a six mark question on the steps 
of crystallization. What are they? I'm gonna put three. I'm gonna, I mean six, sorry. What are the steps to crystallization? What are the steps to making a pure dry crystal? And let's say that it's uh, mm, magnesium sulfur. Magnesium sulfur. Let's assume that it's magnesium sulfur. And this is a crystallization reaction. Guess no one said anything, so we'll just go right into it. So, again, and this is based on my memory. So if I do actually, if I do make a mistake, feel free to correct me. Uh, why does your room look so bland? There's no colours. Dude, the reason why is because I'm getting it all completely done. I have had to move everything out. And also, you can only see a fragment of my room. This is the chimney right here. This is the chimney. This is a tiny percentage of my room. There are the other two parts and literally everything around it. So you are, you are missing out on a lot. Um, but anyways, man. Um, I guess if you have nothing to say, we'll, we'll do it this way. So, crystallization. We have, first of all, got to separate our acids and let me. Good night. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not painting the walls. I, I'm not even them white because... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it would be so weird if I got it painted a different colour. My bedroom, every single iteration of my bedroom for all of my different houses has been white. Except for the time it was blue in my super old house. But that, that was just weird. Like, you know what I mean? Imagine, like blue room. I mean, I'm sure it'd be very calming, you know what I mean? But then, imagine bloody, it'd just be a bit overwhelming. That's why I, I like just a plain colour. I am getting the carpets in the bed and everything else like that redone, but no. Anyways, let's actually do some work here, guys. Uh, that's what we're here for. Whoop. Okay. I've turned off chat, because if you guys aren't going to put answers, I'd rather not have it on so I can actually check the time. So, sulfuric acid... and magnesium oxide. So number one, you want to pour some sulfuric acid and so what I'm going to assume is like a beaker and maybe we'd say 25 centimeters cubed maybe, that seems like an appropriate amount. Pour that into the beaker. Okay, so you pour that in. Next, you want to heat it up because that, of course, increase the rate of, increases the rate of reaction. Next, you're going to add some magnesium sulfur and then you're going to add excess because, of course, you want to get as much as possible of a product. Now, once all the reactions have happened, you're going to filter or filtrate um, the excess magnesium oxide. You're then gonna evaporate, then you're gonna leave it to crystallize. Then finally, if you're making a pure dry, dry crystal, you wanna pat it down. And that's basically it. Now I might have an exam past paper here that I could compare it to, an actual exam technique. If I do, you guys will be in for a treat here because you'll be able to see any mistakes that I've made. But also, you guys will be able to learn from my methods that I did yesterday. Let me just have one second here to myself to look at the period of table.
Ah, uh, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing a past purple here. That's biology. This was homework that you set us a month ago and still hasn't. Still hasn't done. Please, I really need this. Okay. I don't, I don't, oh, is this it? Can this be it? Can, oh, this is it, this is it. Okay. Is it, no, no, it's not, no. Yes, I found it. Okay, guys, this is the actual method. So let's compare it. I put pour 25 centimeter cube sulfuric acid. All it says here is add sulfuric acid to beaker. Warm the sulfuric acid, which is what I put. Add a spatula of magnesium oxide, which I put add some, so I guess specify more. Stir the mixture. And I guess, I guess really what you could say there, so add some and stir, then add Gradually add more until there is no more, until there is only magnesium oxide remaining. Filter the mixture, evaporate, um, and leave the solution to finish crystallizing. So that's basically that. I basically did that right. All I would have had to do is add a bit of extra detail there. Add some, and obviously this is a rough how-to. You would, of course, write in full sentences in the exam here, but yeah. Heat up the sulfuric acid, add some magnesium oxide, um, and then repeat until there is only magnesium oxide remaining. So there you go, guys. If you honestly didn't know any of that, go watch the previous stream. We went all the way through crystallization. Now, what else was there to do from yesterday? I can't remember. Oh, neutralization. All right. You guys obviously know that we did this yesterday pH scale, and remember what I said, look, 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 H2O, the neutralization reaction is OH, H, H plus OH minus. That is probably worth two marks in the exam, and literally all you need to remember is water, because look, two H, so you put one there, one there, one oxygen there and there. Oh, and the state symbol is OH would be aqueous, uh, H would be aqueous, but H2O would be liquid. Okay, what else was there to do with neutralization? I can't remember. I just took apart the pen there, trying out. Has anyone said anything insightful in chat? Let me have a look. Um, <laughs> uh, refurbishing colors of your room, red is more a color for thinking, blue is more cold. I honestly, I, I read a study. Um, I would do answers. All right. Yeah. No worries, dude. Again, you could just watch these streams like chat and stuff. Just remember I am doing my own revision at the same time as helping you guys here. Uh, which is why I'm doing a lot of exam questions and stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I've read a study where blue actually is more like a calming colour. It can actually make people feel calm. That's why I think our gym, school gym, but gym hall, sports hall, is painted blue. I think for that very reason, because it's a calming atmosphere. I think yellow creates um, connotations of hunger and stress, which is why uh, rooms... But of like that actually might make people feel more uncomfortable. Uh, colors of red also evoke danger. It's like a primitive thing. Red colors um, connote danger, which is why actually, well, that's why danger signs are red because even if you're like deaf or whatever, you can still see it and know that it means danger. So I, I would actually argue that blue rooms are better for that reason. 
Um, okay, so anyways. Anyways, anyways. The final thing that we did yesterday was we talked about veins. Uh, or I guess just blood vessels as a, as a whole. Um, so let me go quickly do what I do best and try and explain it. So number one, that is a vein. Veins have valves and they let blood in to the heart. Remember, vein, V-E-I-N. And look, vein, literally the last two letters, in, vein. Artery, arteries have a thick muscle there, which allows for high pressure. Thick muscle uh, But also, they have elastic fibres. I think it's fibres. Elastic fibres? Do you guys remember? Or is it elastic fibres? Which allow for stretching. So that they can kind of conform to whatever shape. Capillaries are one cell thick. And they allow um, ions to be transported in and out of cells for that very reason. So if it's good old Donny cell over there, an ion can go right to it through the capillary. So that's basically it, right? I mean, that's all we did. Um, vena cava. I don't know why that word came to mind, but vena cava is in the going out of the cell, out of the heart. So, guys, on a real note, if you've been paying attention to these mini lessons, at least you're probably less than an hour long, you should now know quite a bit. How much do you know? Let me show you. Number one, electrolysis. Which, electrolysis is a high-grade thing. Remember what I said? A lot of schools don't know this very well. A lot of people in my class, and we're triple science, the high set, hate this. If you paid attention and you kind of understand it a little bit, good for bloody you. We also looked through crystallization, neutralization, we went through um, I guess, I guess we'll draw a line. Biology, we went through mitosis. And we went through, uh, just a quick overview at least, of the blood vessels. Now, I'm going to put a red dot next to the ones that most people don't understand. That one, that one, and I would honestly say most people, I don't think Mr. McCallum's done crystallization with us. So look at that. Quite literally, over 60% of the subjects that I've gone through in these streams are things that people in my class don't even get. So if you've been paying attention, if you even gained one bit of knowledge, think about how many more marks you could get in your chemistry or biology now. That could be up to six marks there. There could be a whole page of crystallization or electrolysis questions. You're looking at maybe 20 marks. What can I say? I am not smart. I'm just making it up as I go along. <laughs> but on a real note, guys, if you've been paying attention here and you understand, good for bloody you. Now, my phone is beginning to die, which is annoying. But either means, A, I'll go AFK for maybe 30 minutes and I'll come back and do more, or I can just go through something else quickly. I guess we can go through something quickly. Is there anything in particular you guys want to go through? English or math? I'd rather do English or math. And then what I'm probably going to do, I'm going to go sit. Um, and I'm going to go do some history. Oh, look. Just, just on my own. So anything in particular? Uh, Eng okay, what, what particularly about English, dude? My iPhone died. Piss. It was about as useless as it. Um. What, what particular? 
I'd rather do English literature because that's the most important bit. Or the more, like, difficult bit. I guess what I can quickly do, we have to write a letter for our test. I mean, up to you, like, what, what, what in particular, a letter? Isn't that for English language paper two, where you have to write a letter or a speech or something? It's question five. Question five is where it'll say write a letter, write a speech, write a, a whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in our bloody marks, wasn't it, man? Um, so, I mean, literally, all you need to do, really, for, because obviously, we're, the thing is with English, you either know it or you don't. I, I hate to be rash like that, but really, you either know it or you don't. And by that, what I mean is, you're either good at it, and you don't need any revision, or you're either really bad at it, and no matter what you do to revise, it's bad. So, I can't really help because I don't... The thing is, it's hard to really explain. But that's a problem with English. It's, it's so tough to explain. But I would say, for your question five, it's worth 40 marks. So, what you really want to be getting is, I know I would say 40 points. No, don't write 40 points. What you really need there is about five good paragraphs, which roughly translates to eight marks per paragraph. Um, and how are you going to get those eight marks? Well, theoretically, you could just do point, evidence, explain, link, point, evidence, explain, link. But that's not going to go well for a letter, is it? You know what I mean? No, no Donnie is going to sit there and read a bunch of peel paragraphs. So instead, what I normally do, I just kind of go with a flow. But I think if you're writing a letter, make sure to have an intro, obviously an outro, Outro, I don't know why I put outro, and then I would say maybe have, the thing about letters, they need to be persuasive. Imagine you're sat there, and your parents are like, evil, and they're like, oh, we will hang you <laughs> if, if you don't explain to us why cars are bad. Then literally, imagine you're actually begging with your life. You're trying to convince them of the best reason why cars are bad. So you need to think of the most convincing things. Use convincing language. Um, we didn't do that well. Uh, oh shit, really? Huh. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I mean again, the thing is, I would say maybe four, four good paragraphs. Convincing language, it's an English language exam at the end of the day. You want to be using convincing language uh, to try and obviously encourage people. Now, I can't honestly think of too many examples off the top of my head, but because it, honestly, to me, it's just kind of natural. Like, I, I'm not saying I'm obviously smart or good at the topic. I mean, I get like grades, grade eights in a English language, and I, last time I got like a grade eight in... English literature, but I can't say that my look will continue to be that good. But what I mean is, I can't really think of much, but if you're writing about cars, you could use personal anecdotes. That's where you kind of almost include a personal, just a snippet of a personal story to get people on your side, to get them onto your sympathy. So if you're talking about cars and fuel, you could lit you could lie, you could say, uh, I remember walking through London and I could barely breathe because the smoke from the cars was poisoning my lungs. Some generic ass shit like that would probably get you a mark. Um, because you're trying to convince people of your opinion and getting people emotionally invested is a good way to do that. I'm awful at explaining and convincing things. Well, fair enough. I would just then kind of think of the most generic kind of things you can think of. So again, personal anecdotes, that is one. Personal anecdote. Um, what else is there? What else? I, I can't really think off the top of my head here. Remember to use a very sentence structure. Long sentences, when you're trying to get across a big point. Short sentences for maybe like shocking and hard hitting things. Um, personal anecdote, Pierre. Um, which is what I, I just said, like a kind of short snippet. 
short sentences. So, for example, a long sentence could be like, um, I... It's so it's hard to do this really under pressure, isn't it? Um, that that's maybe the thing. Like maybe you're you're all right at explaining stuff. Just in the exam, you can't. But a long sentence could be like, um, the issue with cars is that, uh, in comparison to other modes of transport, they are the most dangerous. Uh, they are the most dangerous, um, ugly looking and environmentally damaging some shit like that that could be a long sentence because you've used a list of three um and you've used some good adjectives but then your short paragraph could be like um i don't know well or maybe a one sentence paragraph could be a good a good thing where you literally so imagine we've done all these lines literally just one sentence and then carrying on could but make sure it's something like hard hitting so something like, um, I don't know, hmm. maybe something like cars, cars are more dangerous than, cars have killed more people than the last 20 years of war. You can make statistics of shit like that, but basically... So long as you include things like personal anecdote, maybe just one, data, even if it's not real, data, shocking data to convince people. And you think about it, when you're trying to convince someone, you need to make compelling arguments. But here's something. Um, hang on, hang on. Uh, well, one sec. Here's a really good thing to remember is shit. I've just lost it. Oh, yeah, both sides of the argument. Both sides of the argument. Remember that, okay? So, let's say, for example, I'm saying cars are shit. Yeah, carry on with that. But then, maybe in one paragraph, I say, although cars are harmful, it is true that they have increased the the rate at which people can travel to work, travel to school, and they are responsible for 20% of all, um, they are responsible for 20% of the economy. But then you could also say, while these points stand true, while our counter argument stands true, and then continue. So what, what you're wanting to say is, Cars are shit, but then maybe include even a sentence or two where you say, even though cars are shit, they do have their benefits, but then you want to kind of pull it back almost and be like, well, actually, because if you look at two sides of an argument in the Mark scheme, the markers or, or the examiner kind of, it, it says like you need to make a, an intuitive, a well-constructed thoughtful argument. When I'm having an argument with someone, I try to look at... I don't have arguments often, to be fair. At least I don't think. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but when I'm, like, arguing a point, I, I do look, try and look at both sides. You know, if someone's like, oh, I want to bloody um, do this, I'm like, all right, well, I understand that you want to do this, but actually, this thing is better for this reason. So you're wanting to look at both sides of the arguments. But that's what I would say, at least. So honestly, I, I think that's probably where I'm, I'm going to end today. So tomorrow, I know that I've done a lot of science recently, and you guys might be getting a tad bit fed up, but tomorrow I have an after-school in science. And normally the way I'll, I do my science lessons now is I will cram as much information as possible into my book, go through it, and then I will wait till I get home, and then I will write up as much as it, of it as possible without looking at my book. And then I'll try to do an exam question. But that's the thing about revision, right? Is the way I do mine now is through these streams. Because what I, what I do is A, I obviously write down the info, B, well, I guess step two or whatever, I will then stream and I will then try to explain it to you guys. Yeah? 
Because I find that by trying to explain these complex lessons to people who are of similar age, similar understanding to me, I can try and make it as sensical as possible, like how I was able to explain my courses, which means I can understand it deeper and you guys can understand it deeper as well. Uh, no, I've had it for five years. I, I used to do my whiteboard streams, so I bloody, um, yeah, and I've just had it nailed into my bloody wall literally a couple of days ago, two days ago. Um, but even after I'm done with revision and stuff in the 11 weeks, I guess I'm going to be doing, uh, what do you call it? Just hanging up drawings and stuff here. Add a bit more colour. But anyways, before I go, this will only apply to people in higher, sir. Who are doing a lot of the flies. This is Lord of the Flies, right? Let's just quickly go through this for those who need it. So, and also just a quick recap for me. So, there are the three main characters of Lord of the Flies. You have Jack, who's the antagonist, basically, quite literally, Hitler. Um, you have Ralph, who's the main protagonist, and then you have Piggy, who's the secondary protagonist. And all of these guys symbolise society. Yeah, the funny joke, I mean, it's all about society, man. Um, so basically, Jack symbolises the inert, in, innate, the innate nurture of humanity. Because, because William Golding, the author, he was a weird Donny, um, and he believed that like all humans were capable of great evil. He looked at the Holocaust, where seemingly innocent Germans were literally killing other innocent people, you know, for no reason. So he saw what humanity was capable of, right? And because of this, the character of Jack represents people like Adolf Hitler. Jack, there is a great quote of his where he says, The beast came in disguise, he might come again. Um, so be, I think it's be careful. Um, so we need to be careful. He says that. And that is quite a manipulative thing that he says, which almost references or likens him to Hitler who was also good at delivering speeches, delivering compelling arguments that made people on his side. So in that sense, Jack almost represents Hitler, this, this kind of convincing dictator who is able to compel the masses. So he's quite convincing. Uh, but he starts off as a character twisted by propaganda in a way. He starts off by one of the first quotes and the most memorable is he says, um, besides, we're, we're English, not savages, uh, and the English are the best at everything. Obviously, this likens him to the Nazis, who literally believe they were superior beings who were the best at everything. Uh, but it also just shows how influence a child can be. Um, so at the beginning, he's okay. He doesn't stand in anyone's way, but we see from the beginning he is quite a, an, a he is quite a violent character. He stabs his knife into a tree trunk when he gets humiliated for not killing a pig, which shows his kind of tendency towards violence. He gravitates towards it, and as the novel progresses, he gets more violent and more aggressive. And he is, ironically, the first character to fall to savagery. While um, at the beginning, he's saying how he's not a savage, he is the first character to turn full Luke Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> he bloody out goes up shit. And he starts hunting pigs, he does tribal dances, he breaks up from the initial group. Ralph is almost a foil and almost a foil to Jack. And what do I mean by that? Well, he is meant to represent the good of humanity, uh, the innate nature to help and to lead, but he also represents a flawed democracy. 
Now, how does he do that? Well, his leadership starts off okay, but the problem is Jack is more convincing, like I just said. Jack takes things with a more fun approach, and by that sense, he does things that the boys want to do. All the other boys on the island, they want to play, they want to have fun, they want to do things that they used to do at home. Jack is able to embody that spirit because what he does is he goes on hunts, he has big feasts, all the other boys are kind of like, oh, this guy's cool, he does things that we want to do. Ralph is more logical. He says, all right, hunting's cool, but we need to get off the island. We need to signal for rescue. And while all the other boys are busy bloody, you know, doing Jack's thing, he is there desperately trying to convince them to do the right thing. He takes an adult approach um, to all the other children, and that doesn't work. It fails. He takes a civilized and orderful approach which works at the beginning because the boys need someone to look up to. But as time goes on, they begin to look up to Jack instead. And when that happens, his democracy fails. Um, what you saying, dude? All right, little man, I'm going to be honest. Uh, yeah, dude, I knew it was you from the beginning. I was talking to you, bro. Guess what? Both Kiva and uh, Sammy got a negative. Shit. So guess what? That proves it. Well, dude, literally email her. Literally. If, if you get her to think of choices for you, she'll most likely bloody... What do you call it? She'll most likely think, shit, I've given everyone a negative. Dude, just literally send her an email. Send her an email right now. Just say, hi, miss. I checked class charts. I was wondering why I got a negative, despite the fact I did my work. Uh, any... Information will be appreciated. Thanks. You know, something some as basic as that. Just send her an email. I mean, what you're not going to get told off for sending an email. It's how you communicate to teachers, isn't it? So, yeah, I would I would strongly advise you do that. Anyways, let, let me quickly finish up here, and then I'm going to uh, head off, because my phone is on 9% here. i gotta, I got to hurry, hurry it up. Okay, finally, Piggy... Uh, who we never know his real name, which is ironic because Piggy is the most non-pig-like of them all, the least animalistic. While Ralph is tempted, he, while Ra Ralph is tempted by savagery at one point, Piggy remains completely audible at all times. His glasses quite literally represent the building blocks of society knowledge and wisdom, but also his glasses are literally used to light a fire, which symbolize, fire obviously symbolizes creation and destruction. So Piggy is an important character. He represents order, civility. The thing about Piggly is fucking clapped. Piggy is clapped. And for that reason, and yes, literally in the book, it says like, you know, he has a gr <laughs> A grotesque appearance, right? He, he's fat, isn't he? And because of that, all the other boys take the piss out of him. They don't understand his wisdom. And it comes back to bite them all when the whole island is in anarchy and Piggy gets killed because, ironically, he was trying to use wisdom and knowledge right up until his death. So Piggy, Piggy's character doesn't change at all. The only thing that Piggy really changes is, yeah, he, nothing changes about him. The only thing that changes is the fact that at the beginning, all the other boys kind of shun him. They make fun of him. Ralph is the only boy who can kind of understand Piggy. Um, and he almost has quite like a, a motherly approach to all the other boys because what he does is he cares for like the younger kids, which shows how he he has a good side to him. He is good, but because of his appearance, which is something which is highly valued in society, nobody cares. Literally, Jack is quote-unquote good-looking, but he's not too smart. But in society, looks are valued more than knowledge. And for that reason, Jack and Ralph are, are put higher than Piggy, despite Piggy likely possessing the information that will, would save them all. So there you go. Those are the three main protagonists slash antagonists. 
if you do a lot of flyers, go learn that. But there you go, guys. Please. Take yourselves a break. Go have a sip of water or something. I know I am. That was um a lot of good fun. I, I enjoy doing these streams. Remember, guys, I'm doing one every single day. From now up until GCSEs. And even during GCSEs, I might do half an hour streams where I sit down and we literally just talk about the exam. Maybe as soon as I get in from school, we sit down and I just go, all right, guys, how was it? And then you guys say, oh, what, what did you think of this question? Et cetera, et cetera. I want to make my channel during GCSEs a platform where you guys are able to ask questions and have them answered. And I'm able to answer these questions using my whiteboard, using the limited information that I have. So if you guys did find this stream helpful, if you learned something about electrolysis, crystallization, neutralization, uh, mitosis, the blood cells, if you learned something about um, a lot of the flies, let me know. If you learned something about English, you found my little explanation there slightly helpful. Give it a like, subscribe, share it to people who might also struggle with the same things that you do. Do what you bloody born. Make your make everything good, you know. Uh, and apart from that, stay happy, healthy, and safe. And I'll see you tomorrow where we'll be doing likely more chemistry revision. I know it's it's a little boring, uh, but you know what? Chemistry is a good GCSE to have, and I'm 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 gonna bloody. Try my best to